module number two. Uh, and this is going to be a review of the long list of calcifications that we frequently encounter in the breast that are typically benign. Um, so the message uh, for this part of the talk is that most calcifications that we see in the breast are typically benign. However, the ones that are not can be analyzed by using both their morphology and distribution using BIRADS to determine the management. So we're gonna start by reviewing the typically benign breast calcifications. Uh, BIRADS gives us this great chart uh, for all our findings on mammography, and we're gonna to focus today on the calcifications part of this chart. This comes directly from the BIRADS manual. Um, and we're gonna start by reviewing this list of what we call typically benign calcifications. Again, these are those calcifications that do not require biopsy. Um, so here's just a list on the left, and we're gonna go through examples of all of these. Um, we want to be, uh, we want to know these types of calcifications well because we don't want our patients to undergo unnecessary biopsies. So we're gonna start with skin calcifications. We see these all the time. These calcifications tend to be tightly clustered with lucent centers, as we see nicely on the image on the left. This is pathognomonic for calcifications within the skin, a benign finding. They also occur in typical locations, the inframammary fold, the axilla, the areola and in the cleavage area. Here's a nice example where we have bilateral diffuse breast calcifications, and we see that some in fact are already projecting within the skin um, on this image and multiple bilateral diffuse calcifications in the skin. These are pathognomonically benign and don't require any workup. When we're not sure if calcifications are within the skin, one helpful uh, type of imaging we can do is what's called a tangential view. We ask the mammography technologist to put the, the calcifications in a grid, a BB over the grid, and then take a view tangential to the BB. As we see here in this tangential view, the calcifications nicely localize to the dermis. These are benign calcifications and do not require any uh, biopsy. Here are two different examples of patients who came in for diagnostic imaging, uh, where we thought that calcifications that had been called back from screening may be within the skin. Uh, here are two different examples where we've done tangential views. Again, we put a BB over the calcification, took a view tangential to that BB, and then we look, are these calcifications in the skin? The image on the left is a nice example of calcifications that are within the skin. They localize nicely to the dermis versus on the image on the right, we have our BB. These calcifications do not project within the dermis on this view. These are not skin calcifications and they are not characteristically benign. One helpful sign that's been described in the literature when you think something might be um, calcifications in the skin or something to suggest that calcifications may be within the skin is this tattoo sign. And what this sign says is that calcifications that maintain a fixed relationship to each other on different views as they do here on the ML and the CC, these calcifications again are in a fixed relationship to each other as we move from different imaging projections, um, suggest a dermal location. And when you're still in doubt, you can always do your tangential views um, to help confirm within the skin. Um, tomosynthesis or 3D mammography, which has really come up onto the mammography um, scene in the past decade, also really helps because these calcifications will project within the first few slices, um, confirming that they do have a dermal location. So moving on, just like in other parts in the body, uh, we frequently see benign vascular calcifications on in the breast. The image on the left nicely shows the end process of a vessel calcifying, where we see these parallel lines of calcifications coating this vessel or this tram track appearance. The image on the right is a less densely calcified vessel. We don't see that tram track appearance, um, but we do see the soft tissue density of the vessel. Both of these signs, the tram track sign, as well as just seeing the soft tissue of the vessel, are carrier characteristically benign, we do not want to biopsy these calcifications. Um, and again, this is a benign finding like we frequently see in other places in the body. 
Moving on, uh, we frequently see coarse or popcorn-like calcifications. These are large calcifications that are produced by involuting fibroadenomas. Um, they tend to be peripheral and eccentric in these soft tissue masses, as we see here. Uh, and just to note, these masses can calcify to varying degrees. Here we have an image of this mass, uh, where we still see some of the soft tissue of the mass itself. Uh, but again, these coarse popcorn-like calcifications. Uh, and this uh, mass on the top is the end stage of this process, where we no longer see the underlying soft tissue sign. We just see this dense, coarse popcorn-like calcification. Uh, again, these are benign uh, fibroadenomas and they get their name from resembling the shape of a piece of popcorn. A very frequently encountered benign calcification we see in the breast. And just one nice last example of a densely calcified fibroadenoma. Again, this is benign. It does not require any further imaging workup or biopsy. Large rod-like calcifications are another type of benign calcification we frequently see in the breast. These tend to be greater than half a millimeter in diameter. A small percent may have loosened centers. These occur, occur in a ductal distribution, and that's because they're associated with benign ductal ectasia. Uh, they tend to be bilateral more commonly than unilateral, but especially when this process is just starting, you may see them in just one breast. Usually we start seeing them in our patients who are 60 years or older. Uh, and again, these are benign uh, ductal calcifications. Um, they're going to be larger than the more suspicious linear calcifications that we're gonna review in an upcoming module. Here's two types of these large rod-like calcifications. The image on the left is the more common type. This is when these calcifications still are within the ducts. They're intraductal. And again, these calcifications form uh, related to benign duct ectasia. The image on the right is a less common type of this calcification. These have loosened centers. These are periductal calcifications. And this results when the material within the duct breaks through the wall and calcifies Again, calcifying along the wall of the duct, but again, another type of benign calcification that we want to recognize as it does not require a biopsy. One other example of these large rod-like calcifications, but I want to encourage you all to take a close look at this image. We see these benign uh, large rod-like calcifications, but I want to give you all a moment just to review this case. Um, this was an actual case and it's published in the BIRATS manual. Um, and here within these large rod-like calcifications, we also see this group of fine pleomorphic calcifications. This is a suspicious morphology as we'll review in an upcoming module. Uh, just a nice example to always look beyond what's characteristically benign. Here within this um, area of very benign calcifications, we also saw a suspicious group of calcifications requiring biopsy. So don't get distracted by the characteristically benign and always look uh, beyond them for anything that may be suspicious. Rim calcifications are characteristically benign. Here we see these thin peripheral calcifications that occur around the surface of a sphere. They may be continuous or discontinuous. And what this represents are either areas of fat necrosis or calcified walls of oil cysts, both benign, requiring no further imaging workup and no biopsy is needed. Very frequently, we'll see these in the setting of trauma to the breast and very frequently, women will have multiple similar appearing uh, calcifications like these. We have a large group of patients um, at our practice at UCSF who are undergoing lumpectomy protocols. And what that is, is for patients who've had a breast cancer diagnosis and have undergone breast conservation therapy, uh, we see them very frequently. Uh, we see them for five years after they've had their breast conservation surgery. And in this group of patients, we frequently see dystrophic calcifications. These are going to be coarse, uh, irregular calcifications are going to be easy to see 
often around loosened centers and often in areas of scarring. And these are related to trauma to the breast, whether that's surgery, radiation. Sometimes we actually see these in patients who've gotten into motor vehicle collisions and have had trauma to the breast. These two images on the left from 2006 and on the right from 2008 nicely demonstrate the natural expected evolution of these dystrophic calcifications, where we see that they're a little bit more thin, uh, a little less chunky on the left, the earlier image. And with time, these are going to get chunkier, coarser, uh, and larger. And these are very benign. And one other example of these benign dystrophic calcifications in this woman who had a uh, and trauma to the breast following a uh, car accident. Again, these coarse peripheral large calcifications around the loosened center, in this case, an area of fat necrosis after trauma to the breast. Another type of benign, frequently encountered calcification in the breast. Now, milk of calcium can be a little trickier, um, but this is another type of benign. Uh, calcification in the breast. And what this type of calcification represents is sedimented or layering calcifications in macro or micro cysts. So the appearance and shape of these calcifications is going to depend on how you uh, position the patient and take your mammogram image. So when we put the patient in a lateral projection, and we take a lateral medial or medial lateral image, as these calcifications layer dependently in these macro or micro cysts, they appear uh, more clearly. And as they layer, they're going to appear crescent-shaped, curvilinear, or linear. On the CC or cranial caudal view, as we compress a woman's breast in that position and take an image from cranial to caudal, uh, these are harder to see, but they're going to layer in those cysts. So as you look at them on FOSS layering in those cysts, they're going to be round, smudgy, or amorphous deposits. <clears throat> And here's just a nice graphic representation. So again, as we put the position in a medial lateral or medial lateral oblique position, and these calcifications layer dependently, we see them as crescent-shaped, curvilinear, or linear. And that's as opposed to on the CC view, the cranial caudal view, when they layer, and we see them as round, smudgy, or amorphous deposits. But the key truly is that these calcifications much, must change shape on different projections. If they appear curvilinear or linear on both projections, they're not milk of calcium, they're suspicious calcifications. Here it was an example. Um, I think this nicely demonstrates what milk of calcium appears like. On the ML view on the left, we nicely see this group of calcifications. <clears throat> Excuse me, we see these curvilinear or linear calcifications. And then we go to the CC view, we're looking very, very hard for the corresponding group of calcifications. It is much harder to find them, but when we do finally see them, we see that they're smudgy, amorphous, hard to see, compatible with benign milk of calcium. One tip or trick for our technologist is if you think calcifications are milk of calcium and some of the group are layering, but not the majority, um, what we ask our technologist to do actually is to hold the patient in an ML position uh, for a couple minutes, as long as they can tolerate it. And with time, if these are milk of calcium, the majority to all of the calcifications should demonstrate that layering to confirm that these are benign calcifications that do not require biopsy. Sutural calcifications, we don't see this as frequently anymore, but what these are are benign calcifications that coat the surface of sutures. They appear curvilinear, linear, tubular. Again, we can see these knots. Uh, these are just calcifications on sutures, uh, less commonly seen now, but if you do see these, it's important to recognize them as benign. And one other type of characteristically benign calcifications that we see, and in the United States, we don't see these that frequently, um, are silicone and paraffin injection granulomas. Why we don't see them that frequently in our country is because in the United States, it's illegal to freely inject paraffin or silicone into the breast. But we often see these in patients coming from other countries, and usually they can give us a history that they've had this done most often as part of a cosmetic procedure. Um, the image on the left nicely shows these silicone injection granulomas. Silicone's going to be inherently dense, so we see these masses, and then we also see these dense 
rim calcified mass is compatible with silicone injection granulomas. The image on the right shows paraffin injection granulomas. Uh, these tend to be smaller. And usually the key is that these are bilateral diffuse and the patient says that they've had this procedure performed. Um, the last type of calcification listed in um, the characteristically benign are diffuse, round, and punctate. I also include this in my special, special uh, cases, but diffuse, round, and punctate calcifications may be dismissed as benign. Um, round calcifications are round. You can just draw a circle right around them. They have nice borders. They're less than a millimeter. Punctate is going to be a subset of round, uh, and those are just smaller and less than half a millimeter. So thank you for your attention uh, reviewing that model.